Okay, so MIST left minority report. So obviously, um, there are a lot of different ways to approach the spine. And at our institution, we do have a pretty heavy um, belief in anterior column reconstruction via both a lift and, and, and uh, lateral. Um, however, there are other uh, potential, uh, you know, ways to get to the spine and, and the posterior transfemoral approach is probably the one that's most widely practiced uh, in, in the country, at least. And so today I want to talk about the indications of that approach, the pros and cons um, to the various approaches. We'll go through the technical considerations um, based off of sort of what the AO describes, and then I'll also kind of speckle in my own um, insight, and then we'll do some case examples. So, um, so obviously here you see the different approaches to the spine, uh, the T-lift being sort of a posterior lateral approach through the facet complex to get through Camden's triangle. And, and uh, um, where I came from, like I said, at Rush, T-lift was sort of the gold standard for most inner body fusions. Um, obviously, well, when I came here to San Diego, I then realized that that was not the way things were practiced everywhere. And it was a bit of an outcast, you know, with everybody being pretty heavily <laughs> Sack lateral lunch. influence. Um, and, and, you know, I've come to learn that there are a lot of advantages uh, associated with the lateral approach. You get a larger graph, you can do it all MIS, you can get really good indirect decompression. Um, it's not like you're drilling off the facade. I mean, you can move pretty quickly if you have multiple levels to do from the lateral approach. Um, and you don't need to do a big posterior muscle dissection with that amount of inner body um, support. You can just do perk screws. Um, however, you know, in, in some rare instances, you can get a bowel injury, and that was seen in Japan early on. Um, if you're not, you know, timely, I think you can get a plexus injury, or if you don't have accurate monitoring. Uh, it can be difficult to get to four or five. Um, you can't really get to five one. And OLIF, I think, you know, there are folks who can do it really well, but there's a learning curve, certainly. Um, okay. Likewise with ALIF, uh, you can get a great lordosis correction, um, huge footprint. Um, you get restoration usually at the bottom of the lumbar spine, L4-5 and L5-S1. Um, and, and same thing, you can do an MIS approach from the back, but there's always a risk of bowel injury, vascular injury, uh, retrograde ejaculation, um, ileus. Uh, you need to have an access surgeon, which can be difficult to coordinate with your office. Um, and uh, in some instances, if you get a ton of lordosis, sometimes you may not allow for adequate foraminal compression, particularly with some of the hyperlordotic grafts that are available. And then obviously it's, it's mostly uh, applicable only to L4 to S1. Now we do have backs of surgeons that are capable of getting to L3, 4, but that's not always the case. And it may certainly not be the case wherever you all end up. So TLEF, you know, some of the things that you'll hear and, and not necessarily because they're true, but some of the things that you'll hear is that you can't get sagittal plane correction. Uh, you won't get reduction. You, you won't be able to get a decent graft in. Uh, it takes a lot of time because you have to remove the facet. Um, you can get a CSF leak or a nerve injury. Um, all the graphs subside and most of them don't do. So how could you do this operation? Well, there are some advantages. The first, and I think probably the most salient is that you can actually do a direct decompression. And so you've got access to the fecal sac, the nerve roots, and you, and you can fully decompress them. It can be performed endoscopically, although I don't do that myself, um, but it can definitely be performed MIS. And I think that that's really the way to do it. Um, it's a single position surgery, so, so that saves time. If you really, you know, get them in the prone position and, and kind of do everything you can in terms of graft positioning and reduction, you can get a little bit of lordosis, and there is some data to support that, but it's not a lordosis operation. Uh, it's familiar, you know, coming from the back of the spine, and, uh, you know, you really shouldn't get vascular or bowel complications unless something's gone terribly wrong. Um, but the disadvantage is you don't have a great corridor to put in a big graft. You can't really get um, a significant amount of lordosis, even if you do everything that you, you can to maximize that. Um, and then there's the potential for derotomy and uh, nerve injury. Uh, and then subsidence has uh, historically been an issue, especially with expandable cages. So, yeah, so in the movie Minority Report, there are three psychics and they predict crimes that haven't yet happened yet because it's a little ethically... Um, nebulous because you're getting prosecuted for crimes that haven't happened. But nevertheless, one of the psychics oftentimes has a different um, premonition, and that's the minority report. And sometimes it's right, even though the other two psychics don't think it's right. So kind of see how that fits in. Okay, so my early experience with T-Lift. So this is a patient who I felt needed a direct decompression, 
Um, but I really wanted to kind of push the limits and see what I could do and restore lordosis. And so I placed one of these um, expandable cages and you can see it got quite a bit of lordosis, it went from 10 degrees to 23 degrees, it's like 13 degrees of correction. So it's great, direct decompression with tons of lordosis. I'm gonna have one of these like featured cases that you all get emailed about and you know, it's gonna be awesome. But it didn't turn out being that awesome um, because about three months later, she started having back pain and I got a CT scan and it subsided pretty substantially. And that is something that over at least the first year for folks that had these like rigid titanium expandable cages, if you really try to get more L than the disc space is going to allow you to get um, without significant release, they'll, they'll pretty much all subside to some extent. Um, this one's still healed, um, but at the same time, you know, it gives them a setback in terms of their back pain, and, and it's just a suboptimal result, both in terms of lordosis correction and in terms of postoperative back pain. So there's actually some data that supports this. If you look at expandable versus static cages, obviously the expandable cages will give you some um, improvement in terms of lordosis correction, but they found that the if, um, incidence of subsidence was significantly higher. So almost 20% compared to about 5%. Um, and that was um, particularly true if you did an expandable cage um, with a unilateral facetectomy. So you still have the contralateral facet that's probably, you know, uh, preventing more distraction and leading to more subsidence. Um, yeah, and that's just the data there that kind of shows that with expandable being on the, the right. And you have greater end plate violation, uh, as you might expect. Uh, and you have greater cage subsidence. And so I use expandable t lift cages. I think most of us do, um, or maybe not most, but many of us do in the MIS community. I think you just have to be very thoughtful about what expandable um, graft you choose, how it expands, how it may contact the end plates and stress the end plates. Um, and then, you know, you just can't overdo it. Even if you want to impress your, your, you know, lateral based colleagues and get a bunch of lordosis, you'll pay for it down the road or your patients will. Um, so, where we are at Scripps, we've got two incredible vascular surgeons. Um, I think I can probably speak to this better than anyone in the group because I'm the newest to join. And I've had recent experiences at pretty reputable institutions with vascular surgeons that have quite a bit of trouble getting you to the front of the spine. So um, I'll just sort of leave it at that. But our two are excellent. And so doing an A-lift is not something that we give a lot of thought to because we know that Frankel or Chandra will get us to the front of the spine in like 25 minutes and there won't be any complications and it'll just be there and easy. It is not that way everywhere. It may not be that way where you guys end up. And so you just have to be cognizant of that. Um, so, so that obviously I think helps influence us towards anterior column reconstruction via an anterior approach. And then obviously with, you know, Jeremy and Bob and Greg and Ramin, I have great mentors here. Um, who are all experts in lateral surgery. So that sort of facilitates me being able to learn how to do things from a lateral standpoint. And, you know, you can kind of feel like you're on an island doing a T lift. And so my indications have shrunk, um, but there are still instances where it really is kind of the only uh, operation that will work. So this is just one example. It's courtesy of my buddy Lee Tan up at UCSF, but this is a woman who had an A lift. Um, but after the surgery, which was uncomplicated, she continued to have leg pain. Um, and he got a postoperative CT scan and you can see that there's this sort of bony spicule that's in the foramen. And even though he's got good indirect decompression, the patient was still having radiculopathy and he tested it with a, um, a selective nerve root block and ultimately had to go back in there to get that nerve decompressed. And you can see that image here. So there are some instances where even a perfect uh, indirect decompression are going to um, prevent you from getting the pain relief that you need. And this is a good example of that. Okay, so I want to go over the steps of the operation and then we'll go through some case examples about when I think T-Lift really does shine. Um, like I mentioned, the indications in my practice have gotten a little bit smaller. Um, it's primarily four or five spondies that need indirect decompression, but um, I still do use it and I still think it can work really, really well. So this is sort of a generic um, setup for the procedure. Um, obviously, this is contingent upon a number of things, your O-arm, whether or not you're using navigation, uh, I use navigation, which I'll, I'll speak to in a minute, um, but you're generally on the side of the T-lift as a surgeon, um, and it helps to have the boom um, uh, on the contralateral side just because it can get in your way and you're going to be taking some uh, x-rays with your, your shavers and your graph in the disc space. These slides are from, in part, the AO, and then I made some adjustments to them, and those adjustments primarily reflect um, this guy here in the bottom right-hand corner, John O'Toole, who is one of the, my fellowship directors and um, really, really smart guy, he uses navigation a lot, and, and he kind of worked out a lot of the details. So I don't want to um, 
suggest that all these ideas are my own because they're mostly things that I learned from my mentors, primarily uh, John O'Toole here. So, um, so steps. So, you know, where are you going to make the incision? You can make it basically just four centimeters off midline. Um, some people use two finger breaths. Really, it's contingent upon the size of the patient. So if it's a larger patient, then it's going to be a further lateral trajectory to, um, to get to the facet in the appropriate orientation. Um, but you can always take an AP x-ray and figure out where the facet complex is and then sort of extrapolate from there. Um, I tend to use navigation. So instead of um, using x-ray, I'll, I'll place the, the um, PSIS pin, which you see here on the left, and then I'll get an O-arm spin. Um, and then based off of that, I'll do like what's called a virtual K wire to basically extrapolate back where the optimal incision will be on the skin to allow me to get to the laminar facet junction. And that's where you want to dilate your tube. Um, and then also allow me through the same skin incision to get to my uh, rostral and caudal screw. So it's one of the things that NAV is kind of helpful for um, in terms of streamlining the process. So once you've got your skin incision, then you've got your soft tissue dissection. Um, your serial dilation of MIS tubes, and you essentially want to get them right over the laminar facet junction um, so that you can see something like this. And, and what you're seeing basically is the inferior articular process, the superior articulating process, and a little bit of um, medial uh, space into the canal. So the first step is getting off the IAP, and you can see those cuts, one that's parallel to the fecal sac and then one that's contralateral. Um, it looks simple enough. Most of us in, in MIS just use the drill. The drill is sort of your workhorse. And, and I think we all feel pretty comfortable using it because we use it for all of our decompressions and just feel very facile. Um, one thing that can be challenging, particularly when you're starting out, I think is the most common thing that I see. And I certainly have seen it with the fellows over the past couple of years is when you're drilling um, that sort of orthogonal cut to, to, dice, you know, to remove the IP, you have to get across the pars. Um, for the most part, or I think it's preferential if you do. And, and that bone runs a little bit deeper. And so you just have to just kind of know where you are and, and kind of keep drilling and keep drilling and, and really get across the parse so that you can remove that IAP on block, which is kind of the favorable and, and uh, efficient way to do it. One other strategy is to use an osteotome. Um, you don't have as much visualization using the osteotome, obviously, through an MIS tube. And so you have to rely on lateral x-ray. Um, but this is an efficient way to do it. And if you hear some guy, you know, at, at some conference bragging about how he does T lifts in 45 minutes, it probably means that he's using the osteotome. And so what you can do is you get the lateral x-ray and the red lines kind of show you where the osteotomy cuts are. So the first one is just beneath the, um, the uh, cranial pedicle. So you want to basically um, just kind of hug the pedicle there and that should keep you uh, away from the nerve. Um, and uh, you obviously want to just stop as soon as you get below the level of the pars. You don't want to keep going into the framing. Um, and then the second cut can, you know, similarly be just above the, the lower pedicle um, to try to take off that SAP. Uh, so once you've got the IAP removed, which is what this image shows, then you've got to get the SAP off. And that's going to give you your corridor to the disc space. The blue dotted line is meant to show you the pedicle. And so you don't want to get into the pedicle. You just want to get the SAP off that's flush with the pedicle. And that's going to give you sort of the largest working corridor. And so, well, how do you determine that you're not getting into the pedicle? Because if you're using the drill, sometimes you can't. Well, I would say a couple of things. One is um, if the, you know, if you're drilling into the pedicle, it'll start to bleed. And so it's just sort of something that you begin to recognize. The other is you can kind of just feel with a nerve hook or, or something to that effect where the pedicle is. Since I use navigation, it's pretty easy for me because I can just use the wand and kind of just show myself where the rostral and caudal pedicles are. And then I have a good sense of, of where my drilling needs to be done. So another plug for, for navigation that kind of limits your radiation exposure and, and certainly gives you more information about where your cuts need to be made and if they're complete, et cetera. Um, so, okay, so you've got the IAP off, you've got the SAP off, you've got a nice corridor towards the disc space. Of course, then you've got to release the ligamentum flavum. This is no different than releasing the flavum in any other context. And then you will visualize the disc space. You'll have the fecal sac medially and Camden's triangle. You'll see the exiting nerve root. That is sort of the limitation of what you're going to be able to achieve in terms of placing the graft. Um, you can see it's not a huge corridor. And so that's why um, expandable technology has become kind of more and more uh, popular. 
another thing that I just wanted to sort of mention that's maybe not obvious and some of the fellows last couple of years have, have had uh, issues with or, or been surprised by, if it's a, a slip, a spondylolisthesis, the traversing nerve root, um, say it's a four or five slip, it, it often um, gets pulled down by the, the anterior listhesis vertebra. And so the disc space and the traversing nerve root are gonna be like in the same depth, which I think catches people by surprise. Sometimes they think that it's gonna be more superficial because um, that may be what it looks like on your spine model. But if there's a slip, it often pulls that nerve root to the same depth level as the disc space. And just something to be cognizant of when you're bringing your shavers in and out. I think that's a, a way where nerve injuries can kind of commonly occur. You don't have to identify and expose the exiting nerve root. I feel much more comfortable if it's exposed um, just because then I know where it is and I can kind of um, be more judicious when I'm trying to put in the graft and, and just be sure that I'm not you know, injury in it or putting traction on it. So obviously then you do your discectomy. Um, you can see here that the natural corridor is for you to kind of take this transverse approach, which does give you very good access to the ipsilateral superficial or ipsilateral dorsal disc, as well as the contralateral deep or ventral disc. Um, however, a lot of the disc space is not visualized. And that is why you'll see folks getting uh, you know, you see some studies and cadavers and things like that, where like 15% of the disc is removed. And obviously, if you leave that much disc behind, then your fusion rates are going to be really poor. And so I think if I was going to stress one thing, it would be that, you know, the disc prep is the most important part of the operation. Um, and you really have to spend time to get it right. Uh, a couple of things that I do to try to maximize that. So um, once you kind of get the disc space uh, um access and you, you know get your pituitaries in there and get out some of the original discs and you start going up with your shavers and those are generally the most efficient instruments so um you you want to kind of get the cartilage and, and and get that you know good sound of scraping bone you don't want to be too aggressive and cause an end plate violation and that's a feel thing that we'll go over together in the or but um, you start upsizing your shavers but you can see that with the shavers, you're not getting to those two areas of the disc that are often you know, kind of left behind. And so what you can do is you have that first trajectory um, as shown here by the blue line and the number one, but then you can kind of come out and take a second trajectory with each shaver and get at least that ipsilateral ventral deep um, disc. Um, so I, I do that and that's how I kind of get that ipsilateral disc. And then once that's done, you still have that superficial contralateral uh, disc the best way in my hands to get at that, and I don't suggest that I get it all out, but if you use an Epstein curette, you can kind of reach underneath the fecal sac and, and scrape some of that disc down and, and pull it down and kind of get a more thorough um, uh, discectomy, which I think is critical for fusion. So um, once you finish your discectomy, um, you know, pre-packing, I think is a little bit contingent upon what graft you're using, whether you're doing a unilateral or a bilateral approach, but certainly Fine. for most, Unilateral T lifts. I'm going to prepack. Um, you place your graft. You again have to be very careful that in doing so you're not um, injuring either the traversing nerve root or the exiting nerve root. Um, and a series of trials usually help you establish the appropriate size, just like any other inner body. Uh, and then post packing. So I will post pack with some DBM. I used to put some bone chips in post pack. I had one case where a chip got into the canal. It wasn't doing anything, but it just made me nervous. And even though it was asymptomatic, I don't really put bone chips in, in post packing anymore. Um, but another thing that we'll kind of go over in terms of the technical details when we're in the OR together. Um, so over the top decompression, I actually do this at the beginning, um, but it, at least in the AO's guidelines, they talk about doing it at the end. So, um, one nice thing is you can do the bilateral decompression without making another tubular dilation. You basically just raise the table, airplane it away from you, and then medialize your tube as much as you can. And that should give you a pretty straight shot at undercutting the contralateral lamina and doing a very thorough contralateral lateral recess decompression. Um, it's a little bit um, disorienting, I think, at first. But once you get used to it, you can actually be really efficient at the contralateral decompression because all of your movements and bites are away from the dura um, and you can leave the ligament down to protect you while you're drilling. I usually use a diamond tip just because it is a little bit of a reach and you're, you know, you're sometimes 10, 11 centimeters away from the skin. Um, but once you get it down, it's very effective. Uh, and again, I do this first as opposed to later, just because I guess just because I don't know if there's advantage to doing it at the end, but I always do it first. 
Um, and it's the same way I do my bilateral decompressions from a unilateral dilation. Um, yeah, so once the decompression is complete and the graft is in, um, you're, you're kind of done. So, so then you've got to place your screws, obviously, um, and it can be done in a number of different sequences. You can do it before or after. Um, for fluoro-based surgeons, I think most of them just do it at the end. Um, there's no real reason to do it in the beginning unless you've got a collapsed disc space and you want to try to distract off of your screws. But obviously, um, having screws through an MIS approach with the towers is going to make it really hard to get an MIS tube in. And so if you do want to place your screws early, then what you can generally do is place contralateral screws, distract off of those, and then place K wires ipsilaterally and it kind of bend those K wires out of the way. Um, and that'll give you space to place your tube. And that's generally how I do it. So um, this is a, a demonstration of that. So you can see that I've got my contralateral screws in and I've got the graft in. I probably distracted off of those screws a little bit um, just to open up the disc space or maybe not. But um, I put in the, uh, I cannulated the ipsilateral screws and just mark that space with a K wire. Uh, and then I was able to drop my tube down and, and do the T lift and then you just put the, the remaining screws in over um, uh, over the K wire. And this is a case example where I did a bilateral T lift. That's me and, and Ryan Hole. And uh, in that case, we just did all K wires, even though we used nav and then, then put the screws in over the, uh, the K wires at the end so that we could get our tubes in, like you see there. Because the towers would prevent you from being able to get the tube in place. And that's just a picture of me and, and John O'Toole back from when I was a fellow. Um, you can still use NAV even though you're going over the K-wire. Because of the T-lift, it won't be super um, high fidelity, uh, at least in the um, uh, rostral caudal plane, but it's still pretty accurate in terms of uh, lateral medial. Okay, so um, do either of you guys have any questions before I get into some cases where I think T-lift is kind of a, a good operation? Micah or Cody? I know I went through some of it fast. I'm trying to be mindful of the OR. No, no questions. Okay. So uh, this is a 64-year-old woman. You can see she's got a terrible 4-5 spondy. I think, you know, in my hands, this is somebody that needs a direct decompression, but you can also kind of look at her um, her MRI. And I don't know, you know, if you call it the Mickey Mouse ears or, or whatever, but that floating psoas where the lumbosacral plexus is getting sort of dragged across the... Um, the lateral interspace. So, I mean, obviously, if anybody could do these types of laterals, it's probably the, the folks that you guys have as fellowship directors. But um, in my hands, that's just not safe. And, and um, so it has to be um, not done from a lateral approach. And then she also had had multiple abdominal surgeries and um, some radiation. And so an anterior approach really just wasn't going to be feasible either. And so um, her bone quality was actually pretty poor. So it's like, okay, so it's kind of like, I can't do an ALF because of her previous, you know, general surgery history. I can't do a lateral because of her psoas anatomy. And I'm not too thrilled about doing a T-lift because her bone is not good. So what do I do? So we decided to do basically a bilateral T-lift and, and to do bilateral um, facetectomies um, and also try to correct her lordosis. And so that is a lot easier to do if you've got a fellow who can do the contralateral facetectomy. So that's me on the right and Ryan Hole on the left. He was two years ago, he's in Minneapolis now, he's an excellent surgeon. And so we basically just worked together and actually were able to do it pretty uh, efficiently. Um, one issue is you can see that the tubes are kind of oriented pretty medially, like a standard T-lift, the picture on the left. But if you're gonna be putting in two graphs, you really have to come in at more of an orthogonal plane in order to get the graphs where um, they need to be. Otherwise they'll hit each other when you're trying to insert them, which I learned the hard way. Um, so in this case, uh, I also tried pre-packing, which I think with one graph you can get away with, but with two graphs, there's just too much stuff in the inner space. And so I couldn't get the second graft in. So when we took the pre-packed bone out, then I was then able to get both T-lift cages in. Um, and you can see sort of what the, the final result looked like. Um, another nice thing about this, uh, this particular T-lift graph is it has something called adaptive geometry. So you can see how it looks a little bit funny, but essentially it's a titanium inner with a peak tie coated outer that sort of conforms to the end plate, which leads to a lot less subsidence. And based off of my uh, sort of one year follow up patients with this graph, I think it also um, helps uh, avoid long term subsidence because it's just being loaded in a more thoughtful way as opposed to a rigid titanium expandable. So um, obviously these cages are sort of right next to each other. I then talked to one of my buddies uh, at 
uh, Texas back institution who's going to do a similar case and told them about, you know, redirecting the, the tubes a little bit more orthogonally. And um, he was able to do that with greater success. So here's his case. And uh, you can see that he was able to get the cages sort of closer to the apotheceal rings and get a really good result. So um, that's one uh, case. This is another 83 year old woman. She had breast cancer and diffuse mets um, and really bad bone, um, terrible spondy. Um, so I was worried about subsidence. Uh, she's 83, um, but you can see that she's got just this horrific stenosis and she was starting to have incontinence, which is sort of why, even though in an 83 year old with a cancer history, we decided to do a fusion operation. Um, so again, not something I think that I could have done safely from a lateral approach and also something that I think needs indirect decompression. And so in her, and you, this is the CT. So obviously, you know, this stuff can't be indirectly decompressed. I mean, that's like horrific. And so in her, um, we just did a standard T lift. And I've since gotten away from those bilateral T lift cages um, just because I don't think that they're necessary. If you've got a graph that expands but does so in sort of a, a thoughtful way that conforms to the end plate and isn't rigid like some of the, the classic tie expandables. Um, and this is her post-op x-ray and this is her um, immediate post-op here on the left and this is her at a year on the right and you can see it really has not um, uh, subsided at all so i'm very pleased with that uh, this is a 53 year old guy with a terrible left l fiber dick no instability he's got this big disc and so i just did a discectomy um, did great but then he came back 20 or 33 days lever later um, had another disc herniation um, severe pain, some weakness. So did another discectomy, he did great. Then he came in like 10 months later and um, basically was having recurrence of his symptoms and had basically a third disc herniation. So I don't know, you know, what the teaching you guys had in, in residency was, but the way I was taught, and I think for the most part, it's true with a couple of exceptions is if somebody has a disc herniation without any instability or, or deformity, you just do a discectomy. If it re herniates, you do a revision discectomy. If it herniates a third time, there's probably something about that joint complex that is just incompetent and continuing to try to do discectomies at some point um, doesn't make sense, particularly with the uh, increasing risk of, you know, durotomy and, and complications because of all the granulation tissue and fibrosis and scar. So in that instance, I'll, I'll do a fusion. Um, I didn't want to do an indirect decompression in this case because he still had this big disc herniation and I felt like I needed to get at that to, to relieve his radiculopathy and to prevent him from having any worsening weakness and so I wanted to do a T lift. The problem is doing a T lift in a case with this much scar is that you don't have a lot of room like you don't get the classic corridor and campbins because of the scar. So you really need a small graph that can kind of work around the scar and still get into the disc space. So I don't want to promote any one device, but I think it's good to have a small graph that can expand. Um, and if it can expand bidirectionally, then that's always a benefit, uh, particularly in scar cases. Um, and this is his uh, final results. Uh, so a couple other considerations. Uh, they have these pedicle based retraction systems. I think that it actually is a good way if you're not comfortable working through tubes. Um, it's kind of a good hybrid approach. Um, the pedicle based systems will certainly orient you because you'll have one screw in the rostral pedicle, one in the caudal pedicle, and you'll know kind of exactly where your corridor is. Um, and you'll have a bigger aperture. Um, I would say though that these are not really MIS approaches and, um, you know, size sort of matters in terms of the, the dilation that you make. And so I, I, you know, continue to favor tubular minimally invasive retractors. I think that they're tubular for a reason. Um, it certainly retracts the tissue in a much more sort of um, consistent and, and atraumatic way than those other uh, pedicle based retractor systems. I don't know what that formula means. I just thought it looked sophisticated. So uh, other considerations, they also have uh, these new tubes that have these um, slides or apertures um, um, ipsilateral to you, that allows you to drop your hand. And so you can get a lot better discectomy, particularly contralaterally, like with that Epstein curette that I showed you. So that's kind of a new iteration and a cool thing. Um, and uh, this is again, just showing that some of the newer T-lift graphs have this end plate uh, conformity feature. So you can still expand the graft, um, but you're less likely to get subsidence, which has been one of the, the drawbacks of early expandable technology. Uh, so when you're choosing a graft, I think, you know, you want to think about subsidence. I like things that expand both in the axial plane and the sagittal plane. You want to think about something that's going to have some sort of adaptive geometry and not to be a rigid titanium expanding mechanism. 
Um, for pseudo, you know, I think you want to try to avoid smooth peak. Um, and obviously, the bigger the graph, the better. So biplanar expansion is nice. Um, if you have to do a direct decompression, especially for a reop, um, then a small footprint is going to be very much beneficial. Uh, similarly, a small footprint with a graph that can expand is going to help you do it through a smaller tube. And I think most MIS surgeons want to get away from the 26 millimeter tubes and start doing it through 22 millimeter tubes. Um, but if uh, you have a big graph, it's not going to really allow you to visualize the, the nerve and the things you need to see when you're, you're placing that graph. Um, this is just a random picture of a T-lift uh, and there's Melanie in March. So um, that's kind of it. Do you guys have any questions? I know we went through it a little bit fast. No, that was great. Thank you very much. Did you guys do T lifts in, in residency or did you do mostly A lifts and laterals or a combination of both? Uh, in my training, it was T lift was the workhorse for inner body, uh, occasional A lift, but no laterals. Okay. And did you do it open or MIS or? Uh, it, it was booked as an MIS, but uh, I think it kind of trended more towards the open. Got it. Well, I think you'll see if you do it, you know, especially through a 22 millimeter tube, it can be a very different operation. And, um, and that's sort of the takeaway. And, and hopefully you guys will learn to love it. And um, as I said, I think, you know, the, the power of lateral and, and how facile you will both get it lateral working with Bob and Greg and, and Jamie and, and Ramin, um, that's probably going to be one of your workhorses. Um, but if you have somebody that needs direct decompression, or if you've got somebody at four or five that has a psoas anatomy that's unfavorable to a lateral, I'd still think this is a great option. Um, you're not going to be able to get the lordosis you maybe would be able to achieve with the other approaches, um, but you can get a good fusion, you can get a good decompression, and if you're thoughtful about it, you can avoid subsidence. Thank you again. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, my, my experience kind of mirrors Micah's. Um, we're basically T lift only. Um, not really. There's no access at Harbor, and then one of the places we were at had access, but they didn't do that many a lifts and then zero lateral. So it was, it was mostly yeah. open. So it may not be your go-to, but it's something you guys need to be comfortable doing before you leave. So, you know, we'll do a couple together. You know, maybe when I've got them on the schedule, you maybe should just call on over just because, you know, they're pretty rare at, at uh, our institution. And then we'll probably set up a lab at some point as well, just so you get comfortable doing it through a tube. Perfect. Cool. Yeah, that'd be great. All right, fellas. Have a great day.